especially if we're working a lot in developing countries. So changes in terms of political leadership can shift the entire balance in terms of where a country is, is moving. Welcome to this podcast created by the Estonia Briefing Center. In this series, we invite some of the most influential people in politics and business to discuss all angles of digitalization in Estonia and the world. From past learnings to current challenges and future plans. So take a seat, pour yourself a glass of your favorite drink and enjoy the art of digitalization. Well, uh, hello and welcome to another episode of The Art of Digitalization. Uh, my name is Florian Marquez and today we are here with Kevin Damaru, who is the Head of Business Development for Data Exchange Technologies uh, at Cybernetica. Kevin, thank you so much for being here. How are you today? I'm very good and thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. Um, I guess the, the very first question that we can kick this off with is what does Cybernetica do and what do you do at Cybernetica? Well, that is a, a great question and I, I guess we can extend this uh, podcast to a couple of hours then. But uh, maybe shortly, Cybernetica was initially founded in 1960 as the Institute of Cybernetics under the Estonian Academy of Sciences. Well, naturally, Estonia was then still part of the Soviet Union and it was in some sense unique that the Institute of Cybernetics was founded in Estonia because it was not a straightforward decision. There were several candidates uh, proposed that at the time. But in some sense, we view that having the Institute founded uh, in, in Estonia and placed in, in Tallinn actually also kind of catapulted some of the uh, developments of Estonia in terms of uh, science and, and research in this field. Mm. But we were later spinned off into a private entity as, as part of a science reform in the 90s in Estonia. And then we started to, to be a sort of a private entity that deals with finding solutions to complex challenges, both in, in government, uh, public sector, healthcare and, and for enterprise, for marine uh, communications and, and border surveillance and so on. So there's quite a quite a wide breadth of things that we do, but I'd say the core of it is that we we try and focus on research and development as sort of the core or something that's very close to our, our hearts. So mm. so looking at what kind of means of, for instance, cryptography uh, and what kind of sort of novel approaches can help us solve these challenges in a way that maintains you know, information security, data security, uh, privacy of, of citizens and, and data and create these solutions that are really robust uh, in the sense that they, they are not prone to, to malicious activities or, or attacks, but also that they are sort of usable uh, for, for the purposes that they have been built Mm. Uh, you mentioned the the spin off that would have happened just after uh, Estonia regained independence in 1991. Um, what has Cybernetica done uh, in Estonia, so sort of for for the Estonian government uh, space, um, and what is it taking abroad afterwards? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a that's a good question. I'd say the the most evident or visible thing that we have done perhaps is, is related to the X-Road or which mm -hmm. is known as the Interoperability and Secure Data Exchange Framework or, or model in, in Estonia. And this is something that we were the main thinkers behind already beginning in the 2000s or even in, in the late 90s. In some sense, I'm sure the, the listeners know quite a bit about X-Road. It's in, in a way, you know, it's, it's more an innovation of combining uh, existing technologies in a novel way for, for a, a certain type of, of governance based on distributed architecture and, and based on, on the fact that you have independent stakeholders with their own mandate, mm -hmm. legal mandate, policy mandate and their own organizational boundaries. But in an ecosystem like in public sector, they need to communicate with each, with each other and exchange data quite, uh, quite intensively and on a regular basis. So this is something that we approached by combining you know, things like timestamping, public key infrastructure, cryptography, digital signatures, and, and so on. So, so 
pooling together different areas where we have actually been innovators and, and researchers in for, for quite a long time and, and making that sort of combination really uh, something that targets uh, complex challenges in, in governance. So that's perhaps one one area. But then there are other these foundational pieces that we work on, such as digital identity. Mm -hmm. uh, again, since the early 2000s, we worked on the first ID card pilots in Estonia and throughout the years have been partners for the Estonian state in in these sort of really complex challenges around cryptography. For around, decades now. For decades, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and of course... Well, today, as an example, the, the smart, uh, smart ID solution in Estonia and used in the Baltic countries is, is based on, on the underlying technology of, of split key, uh, which is sort of a, a tokenless digital identity or, or a, uh, a solution that doesn't require any hardware security or any sort of security on the user's side. Uh, if you think about ID cards or mobile ID, they, they carry physical like chips. Uh, on the ID card, you have the chip and the SIM card, in, in some mm. sense, is a chip. Split key does not require these kind of hardware uh, solutions on the user side besides their smartphone, in some sense. Yeah, so just just for the non-Baltic listeners, uh, Smart ID is is the uh, is the application both for iOS and Android uh, that can be used um, across the three states, and as you said, is based uh, on on Split Key. Um, how do you fit into Cybernetica? What do you do? Well, I I do quite a quite a few things, but perhaps my my main area of work is related to secure data exchange and interoperability, and and to broad more broadly from that digital transformation of both public sector and then also enterprise companies. So so we look at how to perhaps redesign how these entities and organizations and largely ecosystems mm. work together. Uh, so we have found that the, the Estonian sort of model or the model for interoperability and secure data exchange based on a distributed architecture is something that's really based on really universal principles for information security, for governance and and, and these can be widely adopted in, in different settings, different domains, different um, sectors, such as, well, of course, starting from public sector and, and government in Estonia, but also to, to healthcare, um, to uh, insurance, as an example, perhaps even banking and, and wider enterprise use cases. Yeah. So that's what I, I do um, in in sort of a uh, concise form. But but in essence, my work is is really about working with government uh, sort of leaders for digital transformation and, and also private sector leaders all over the world in in Africa, in Asia, and in the Americas to help them understand how to how to build their sort of digital transformation strategies and and action plans and and how to actually make that happen in a feasible way that is forward-looking and then can sustain their future needs. Mm. What is the, I mean, overall, it's a no doubt a very rewarding job. Um, what is the most frustrating and what is the most gratifying part of your work? Well, I think maybe in terms of frustration is that uh, there's a lot of curveballs that can come <laughs> into different projects that, that we work on. And in some engagements, there are challenges that do not perhaps depend or rely too much on what we can do. Like political risk is, uh, is a very high, high challenge or sort of a, a high occurrence for us, especially if we're working a lot in developing countries. So yeah. changes in terms of political leadership can shift the entire balance in terms of where a country is, is moving. And in that sense, you know, if, if we've already created buy-in and understanding for, for some leaders in government or, or in enterprise, and if there is change, then it's sort of a, the process has to restart from, from the beginning. Mm. And given that these are already complex challenges, complex issues, uh, these sort of getting from your first conversation to actually uh, full implementation takes several years. I mean, we know Estonia for for reaching maturity it took 10 15 20 years right yeah. and and we are still growing and and developing 
for other countries, of course, we can cut out some of that time because of the lessons learned and the experience mm-hmm. we've gained. But um, it's it's sort of inevitable that it still takes time for people to get on board, to change their minds about how they do things today. But also that you have so many different stakeholders that all have to uh, buy into this because they have existing strategies, their own plans, their own ambitions and so on. So so it has to fit with uh, with their thinking and and their objectives so in terms of yeah the the biggest downside i'd say is is perhaps political risk and and having these curveballs come in that yeah. uh, that we can't control that in any you way. shouldn't have any influence on because if cybernetica could change governments uh, that would be a, a whole other topic i think but about <laughs> the most the most gratifying side as well well and then the, the most gratifying side i'd say in some sense is the the flip side of of the, the the biggest challenge is is the people that that we get to work with and experience so many different cultures around the world um, I mean, the ability to to travel to to places like I don't know Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Rwanda, Namibia, Ethiopia, to the, to the Philippines, to Japan, America, and so on. Latvia, Dif- Latvia, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> A lot of uh, a lot of these these places have their own unique characteristics, and what we found is, you know, uh, principles of information security are relatively universal around the world mm-hmm. in, in democratic countries, of course. Um, but the culture and the political dynamics are very different in in every country, and and that that is very unique to to all of the uh, the governments and the the enterprise that that we work with, and and I think that is that is really rewarding just to broaden our our minds as well, not only in terms of the technology landscape, but to understand humankind in mm. in some sense. You just mentioned democratic countries. Um, there are sort of two questions that are connected to one another. Uh, number one, um, how how does Cybernetic approach their client base? Uh, do you have certain rules that you've set yourselves, like some kinds of countries that you would not work with for for ideological reasons? Um, and and number two, connected to that, uh, are there certain target markets that you're looking for in particular right now? So I'd say the simplest approach for us is following the guidelines or sort of suggestions of the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mm-hmm. And and that's what we go by. And, and usually when we have doubts, then we also consult with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, whether it makes sense for us to, to work with these partners. And I say with uh, these principles are universal for, for democratic countries in the sense that they, you know, build on principles like distribution of, of powers for the legislator, for for the justice, for, for the executive. But even more so within the executive, you also need to have distribution of, of powers so, so that it would not be all centralized in yeah. in one single location. Um, but in that sense, we we see that the projects and and the solutions that we work on are in some sense tools of of democracy. Mm-hmm. Um, that they bring you know information security, privacy by design solutions, so that the citizen in the end becomes more protected. And that I'd say is is the the ground for us of of where we where we start from. And in terms of what we are looking for or what kind of regions we are, are targeting, I'd, I'd say today our, um, our breadth is, is quite uh, deep uh, in Africa already. So we have quite a few projects in, in Western Africa and are expanding also to, to the rest of, of the continent. And, and naturally in, in Asian countries, uh, this is an area we, where we are more and more uh, getting a, a foothold. But yeah. perhaps the area that we're looking to target uh, even more uh, in the future is is the Americas and the United States in, in particular, as that is a very sort of interesting um, territory or sort of in- interesting uh, domain for us, mm. but not only for, for public sector, but also for, for private sector use cases and for enterprise use cases in the sense that a lot of these best practices in government governance, and again, in information security, as, as I've said, they're, they're relatively universal. And, yeah. and if you have independent stakeholders in these sort of value chains or, or ecosystems that need to communicate, then it, it does make sense, at least in our view, of course, 
<laughs> to uh, to implement uh, these solutions that that we've been developing. Would it be fair to say that, especially in more federalized countries, uh, your solutions might have an easier time of getting, gaining a foothold? I'm I'm looking at countries like the US, uh, also like Brazil. Would that be places that would be, um, yeah, particularly uh, uh, fertile ground for your solutions? I'd say yes, yes and no in some sense. Mm. So um, it's definitely easier to gain a foothold in federal countries in some some states, mm. as an example, uh, because states largely have quite a lot of independence. And in some sense, perhaps can be compared to the European Union, how each country has their own independence, but less so in, in that yeah. regard. So you can start off with uh, with specific states. Now, the challenge there is actually that states still, even with their independence, rely quite a lot on federal government uh, services, federal government agencies. So if a state, as an example, implemented an interoperability solution within the state for secure data mm. exchange, they would still need to uh, have agreements with federal states for that to actually be a holistic uh, approach for them because there will be loops or sort of holes or gaps in yeah. in processes if if they don't have that and from another perspective uh, as well if if we compare federal states with unitary governments like Estonia as an example where you have you know you have a central government and you have perhaps slightly weaker um, local governments mm -hmm. or local municipalities the central government has more more say in in what kind of approaches or strategies to pursue so yeah. in the Estonian case to a degree perhaps it was simpler to implement an interoperability solution in a whole of government approach in the sense that central government does most of public sector mm -hmm. work in in some sense and in in federal countries the federal level perhaps does not ha carry that kind of weight they can of course pursue policy measures uh, but in terms of implementation and, and having an in implementation body mm. that does this that that perhaps is is not feasible More and that's yeah. yeah and that's what we see as well is is that in in countries like the united states um, in the the sort of uh, opportunities that we pursue we're not looking at creating uh, the type of you know, uh, solutions that take over the entire country, but mm -hmm. rather perhaps sections, states, uh, larger uh, municipalities or some federal agencies and start there. Uh, but in a way that we're, we're trying to approach policymakers, that they think about policy that creates an ecosystem for private entities mm. to work in a way that if they build solutions, these are by default already, already you know, adhering to some kind of open standards yeah. so that these solutions can be interoperable. So if one state adopts or implements a digital identity solution and it applies the the standards set by the federal government, then they can sort of integrate different uh, states' solutions together. So, so that's what would make sense in our view. I think it's fair to say that uh, those federal states really lend themselves to uh, number one pilot projects just to see if something works and that could then be adopted by other states that might be interested. Or, as you said, at least to have this, this baseline interoperability um, so that it can also work together with other solutions should they arise across uh, across the country. I think that's fair to say. Um, could you maybe give us some some examples, some projects uh, that you've been working on, uh, be it in the be it in the Americas or uh, in Africa? Sure. So from from Africa, perhaps I can I can bring out an example from Benin, which is in in Western Africa, sort of the the home country of, of voodoo religion. Um, and, and there we've been working on implementing a, a nationwide interoperability and secure data exchange solution together with a citizen portal that uh, sort of comprises different services targeted for citizens and acts as a one-stop shop for mm -hmm. them. And this has been really interesting for us to see some of the the challenges that uh, come along with working in, in countries that perhaps do not have very developed markets in terms of uh, ICT and also the, the skills perhaps, mm. but also in terms of what you see that can be achieved if you have really strong political will. Because there in, in Benin, we've seen that the minister that is responsible for, for these areas has been actually 
actually following these developments and, and keeping a close eye on, on what's happening and actually pressing the both us, the companies uh, implementing this, but also the, the government agencies behind this to, to, to you know, focus on an actual impact, not just implementing or not installing software yeah. and, and putting servers in, into Iraq. But the end question is, you know, what changed after mm. this? Did did someone get a better service? Did some service become available that wasn't available before? So so this is really interesting for us. And it's always a pleasure to work with, with governments where you have this kind of sort of really strong political will and, and people that put their hearts into it and actually try and try and bring this impact forward. What stands out to me with that example is that it's exactly not just about the, the back end, but also the, the front end, the sort of the customer facing or citizen facing uh, solutions. Can you give us a rough idea about the, the time frame that it took for, for this kind of development implementation uh, with a pretty strong political support? I'd say it took us maybe about two years or, or so. And, and well, this work in Benin is, is still ongoing. Mm-hmm. But I'd say two years perhaps is, is feasible. Yeah. Um, any, any examples from the Americas sides perhaps? Sure. So um, in the Americas, we're working with quite a few actually Caribbean islands. Uh, so the Bahamas is an example. And, and so we work in, in different partnership settings, right? In, in Benin, to jump back perhaps uh, just shortly, we work with another Estonian organization called the E-Governance Academy, mm-hmm. which is a non-governmental organization, and a local partner, OpenSI. Uh, and the main client there is the government agency for, for digitalization. Yeah. Um, but we have different different approaches to, to partnerships and, and our work. So as an example, in the Bahamas, we work with a company called Cloud Carib. And uh, in some, some situations, these partners take a more leading role in projects. And this perhaps is an example in in the Bahamas where where this company had quite a lot of strong understanding of the underlying technologies and was actually able to to work more closely and more independently with the Bahamas government. Uh, So we were actually in some sense in a more laid back position, providing them with the knowledge transfer and the the insights that we have gained. And and of course, the the core solution. But eventually they were the ones that were able to to implement this and and grow together with, uh, with the government. And some some other examples, perhaps of islands again, is is in Aruba, um, and and there we are actually working uh, directly ourselves with the the government. So again, a different perhaps partnership uh, uh, scenario or or setting, and and there we are actually doing quite a lot of this policy and in general organizational work as well in terms of uh, creating capacity for public servants to understand mm. what kind of you know trends are in e-governance and what e-governance as as a bigger uh, thing actually means and what the the sort of conceptual architecture behind that is so that they understand not only so that not not only the technology people understand what's being implemented but the policy makers yeah. have a strong understanding of of what's happening and also to perhaps sort of uh, initiate this shift in in their thinking. Yeah, uh, you just mentioned two uh, two uh, island nations, um, and I was wondering: is is there any scope in the future for interoperability across different Caribbean islands? Um, I mean, when we think about yes, we've got the European Union, we also have CARICOM in that region. Would that be uh, within the scope of uh, of future projects potentially? Absolutely. So. This is something that that we've been discussing internally and and with those island nations as yeah. well already is that you know there's there's a lot of economic uh, incentives for them to actually have this kind of federated uh, community or federated ecosystem that you know data can move freely across these these islands in terms of tourism you know and and today especially as well in in times of of covid and a global mm. pandemic they're trying to perhaps look at creating a uh, a travel bubble in in some sense but you need to have this kind of trusted data exchange for for that to be feasible um, and this is something that we're definitely pursuing, uh, hopefully, in, in the coming years that will be possible as, as well. And that depends on, on some, some sort of issues or, or points. One of them is a question of, of 
legislation or, or policy in mm -hmm. some sense that naturally the interoperability solution that we work on can be federated in the sense that one uh, political union or entity like a, like a government or a state yeah. can have their own um, sort of instance or ins installation of, of that solution and another uh, political entity can have another installation of that solution mm -hmm. and they can federate it together and this makes sense in in situations where you know you have a lot of legal boundaries between these territories in some cases it might also be feasible to create a joint uh, installation and a jointly operated and managed installation so that you don't have to uh, rebuild uh, all of these sort of different components for mm -hmm. each of the the islands separately but perhaps simply use a, uh, a common um, sort of uh, leadership or organizational uh, structure for managing this and, and simply then be able to connect to all the different organizations and, and entities that, that you need to connect. Sounds certainly like uh, this would be, first of all, good for some financial savings, uh, but also if, if you uh, are neighboring nations anyway, and, and there is a, a quite a big incentive uh, for e-health data exchange or general migrational data exchange, mm -hmm. um, there would be a lot of uh, yeah uh, good reasons um, to, to have this shared model. Um, what interests me as well is... Uh, how your personal interests and how your sort of uh, personal development, education, uh, career, how all of that led you to your position at Cybernetica. Can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. And, and in some sense, I, I've, I've thought about it myself. And I, to me, it's a bit interesting because I never thought I would end up in, in technology or, or actually in not just technology, but somewhere where, you know, we're working on really core challenges in technology mm. like cryptography, attack trees, uh, timestamping and, and so on. But what perhaps led me to this was that I've always been interested in in governance, in in politics, mm -hmm. and and you know how public sector works and actually is able to deliver um, services and a better life, uh, to put it simply, to to citizens and and to their people. So I studied public administration and, and political sciences in, in Taltec um, and later I, I studied uh, strategic communication in, in Tallinn University as well. Mm. And and these perhaps together made or, or created a, a combination that, that sort of helped me understand the political and the policy aspects of governance and also of, of technology. And on the side sort of I've, I've learned about technology itself. Uh, to to understand what is possible and and sort of what kind of means are are feasible uh, in terms of implementing that for uh, for governance and and today I'm I'm actually a, a fellow in in SIPA in the Center for European Policy Analysis as well in their transatlantic leadership program mm -hmm. and I'm I'm doing research at the moment on actually how to implement or how to bring these best practices from Estonia over to the United States. So SIPA is a transatlantic uh, think tank uh, working uh, or based in, in DC in, in Washington. Mm. And uh, usually SIPA works on advising these transatlantic issues and, and bridging the gap and finding common ground uh, between these two um, territories and and I am I'm looking at bridging a, a gap in in e governance in some sense you know a virtual gap a virtual yeah. gap yeah. <laughs> yeah so I'm I'm looking at two two key areas actually in some sense uh, the the foundational pieces in e governance that we view as interoperability and secure data exchange as as the one and secure authentication and digital signatures as as the second one so again really simply to exchange data between agencies and create uh, capabilities for citizens to access services in a secure way online. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm looking at how to you know, bring this uh, experience and perspective from Estonia, which is a unitary government, to a federal state much mm. larger than Estonia, of course, and completely different in terms of how governance operates. In some sense, completely different because still a democratic state, but simply a, a federal one. So yeah. there are more layers and perhaps more complexity because the more people you have in, in a machine, the, the more complexity you have there as, as well. 
Absolutely. I can certainly relate to that, uh, being a political scientist myself and then having found out about or discovered uh, e-government for myself uh, at a later stage. Uh, it's a very relatable story. Um, one last question that goes back to, to your childhood, perhaps. Um, when, when I moved to Estonia, uh, I you know, was in my mid-20s and I all of a sudden realized, like, wow, the digitalization in Estonia works completely differently than in other countries. Um, as a kid, as a teenager... As, as a young student, were you already aware of how special e-government services in Estonia are? Did you assume that it's the, the same in, in the rest of the world? Or, or did you already have that feeling that uh, it is something different? So for a, for a long while, actually, I, I had no, no understanding of yeah. that. Because in some sense, the younger you are, the less the less interaction you have with government or public services as well. Hopefully, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Most of this is, you know, done by your parents. So yeah. in terms of public services, what you experience perhaps is is some kind of healthcare procedures, education as, mm. as an example. And in terms of education, of course, we had e-school uh, quite early on. Yeah. And, and that was a sort of a revolutionary in that sense uh, for us because, you know, not having to carry around your, your like notebook or diary uh, to, to you know uh, get grades in that and and so on so so that was quite a big shift uh, growing up but i so i i grew up in a small town in northeast of estonia called kivioli which is a sh- sort of an in- industrial town mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and when i moved to tallinn for for university perhaps then then that was when i started to to understand more about what kind of developments estonia has gone through and the more i started traveling uh europe actually initially with uh, as part of some of my my sort of uh, uh, political science and and politics interests, then then I started understanding how different we are yeah. actually compared to not only developing countries but other much more developed Industrial countries. Industrial nations, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, absolutely. Um, Kevin, sadly, this is all we have time for uh, for today. Um, but thank you so much for this lovely conversation. I hope that you guys at home also enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, to all the listeners, uh, please stay tuned for the next episode of The Art of Digitalization. And that's the end of yet another thought-provoking conversation about the art of digitalization. In the meantime, make sure to stay connected with eEstonia on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. You can also check out our website e-estonia.com to learn more about digitalization in this beautiful country and other upcoming events. For now, that is all from our side. Stay tuned for our next podcast episode and have a great day. Thank you.